My next guest is Greg Goodland. He is a pioneer in translating research science to learning superior achievement in the classroom, boardroom, and anything else. A recovering high school music teacher for 13 years, he found within teaching music the fundamental principles that allow for accelerated improvement, commonly referred to as talent. This was a result of serious interest in and study of cognitive and behavioral neuroscience psychology that teaches that teachers are not taught in teacher training programs. Using his teaching as a lab experiment with these ideas, he developed unique expertise in explaining to anyone the elements needed to reach any level of success with any skill that is desired. He occupies a singular space as a translator between the research and practical use in our lives and um, what is actually possible in our own achievement is mind-blowing. There's no talent necessarily. Welcome to the podcast, Greg. Thanks. I'm thrilled to be here. It's going to be so much fun talking to you about this stuff. Well, tell me, first of all, a time you, when you were in the trenches and managed to crawl out. I got two of them, but if we don't have time for the second one, that's fine. That was more my epiphany to what I'm doing now. But the first one, man, probably my greatest lesson as a teacher, and no one else could teach it to me. My principals didn't know it. The people running academic affairs didn't know it. I never heard about it from my fellow colleagues. And it was an amazing revelation. And I don't know that it's something a lot of us know. So there was a student who was particularly far behind. And of course, the parent came in and it was a bit of a reading of the riot act. And in fact, it got kind of bad to the point the principal stopped the meeting. That's how bad it was. And they were just convinced he's doing all his work. He just doesn't get it. So, of course, yeah. that falls to me. So I have to be available after school and make extra time to, to make up for the time he wasn't doing his work. And and I and anyway, and so we did some things. And there was one particular thing I said, now, what you're going to, you know, until you catch up, you're going to want to be spending some time with this each night, you know, five nights a week or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And and so I said, what you need to do is this. And you need to do this every single time you sit down to study. And through that repetition, you'll gradually become more familiar with it. And then you do this. OK. And so anyway, a week and a half or two weeks passes. And he's sitting. Remember, he was sitting in the front row of my class. We were doing some warm ups. And I said and I saw it. I said, oh, whoa, wait a minute. Didn't we talk about that? He says, yes. Yeah. I said, did you do it? Yes. So did you follow instructions? Yes. How many times did you do it? Once. Once. And I said, well, I asked you to do it every time you studied, right? And he said, yes. And I said, why didn't you? Drum roll, please. I don't know. <laughs> the typical answer for kids. And the realization I had, and I don't know why we're not being taught this, students will truly, truly believe they are doing their work as a sign. It's really hard. It hasn't everyone noticed by now. It's really hard for human beings to follow directions. So you kind of, what I should have yeah. done is ask him every day, did you do it last night or yeah. something? But then I'd get a phone call saying, how come you're harassing my son every day? Anyway, um, <laughs> I realized at that moment, because the, the, the crux of the argument the parent and the student were making is I'm doing everything. And I'm like, something, there must be a disconnect there. He truly, truly believed he was doing everything and yeah. couldn't figure out why he seemed so stupid in my class. It's because he's not stupid. He was just not following directions. And this has imp great implications for students, for teachers. And I just, I was in my, I think, 12th year of teaching high school at that point. Nobody had notified me of this. That they're, that they're, I knew, hey, listen, sometimes people lie. Okay, sometimes, a little bit here. Sometimes they're not sure. Sometimes, sometimes they're absolutely 100% convinced. They're bought, and it makes it hard on us, right? Because what do we do? What we're doing should be working. Maybe everyone just has this different capacity and one person has more talent than the other. That's not it at all. Much of the time, they're not following directions. So that was my, when I got a view of that, and I realized there was no dishonesty involved. There was no incompetence involved. It was a true belief that he was following all directions and he couldn't figure out. And there's a lot of this going on, a lot of it. Well, how did that lead you? You said you had a second story that kind of led you to where you are now. Well, okay. yeah, I, I, I had been working for many. I had been very, very serious about trying to figure out the best ways teaching works. And so like, like anyone else who's serious about this, I found this tip or I went to that conference and found that tip. Oh, my gosh, if you do this, it's totally different than normal, but it works way better. And then you go and try it out and it does. And you say, OK, I'm going to incorporate that in my thing. And I was gradually piece by piece, like most of us 
piecing together all these strategies and ideas that really work well and better than sometimes the status quo that, that we want to use regularly. And it was just like a hard fought battle, every piece of information trying to find it. And the first five years of figuring this out, I was trying to figure out what talent was because I want to make sure everyone can pass my class. And then when I realized talent wasn't, at least wasn't what we really think it is, in the next five years of figuring out, then what do I do with this? And then I, so I pieced this together. I had these unusual methods, this work, that work. And then having done that for five years without any knowledge of the science, mind you, that I now use so frequently, um, I picked up a book. It's a book I, you know, what I always say is if you read one book the rest of your life, other than the book of your religion, it should be Talent is Overrated by Jeff Colvin. And the only reason I got it is because I kept telling people talent doesn't matter. I can see maybe you need it to be a super duper duper this or that, but which it turns out you don't. But, um, but you know, for passing a class in high school, you don't need it. And so I figured the book was on sale for bucks. Oh, I almost missed it. Four bucks. I bought it. I figured ah, it'll give me, an, uh, you know, something to use in parent meetings. See, this author says that talent doesn't matter that much. Oh, my gosh. The book blew my mind. Everything that I had been putting together all that time all fit and could be made much better by going down the research avenues he presented. And I remember where I was at a stoplight after work in my hometown, having driven you know, the 30 miles home, stopped by the store to pick something up. I was at a stoplight and it's where in the book he starts talking about mental models. And it all clicked for me, how this all contributes to a mental model, how the mental model is what makes you smarter. Um, and that's when everything fell into place. And I felt at that moment as if I had been struggling to climb a mountain. Every time I got higher, I got better. So it was good. It was always an upward thing, but each thing. And after I read that and realized there might be answers out there, it was as if I had gotten to the top and could see the whole valley below. Now it was just a matter of going down in there and figuring out how each thing worked. And that is what started, which was hard for me because it wasn't fun at first. And it's not always fun anyway, the the, the reading of the science and learning how to read the cognitive science. But certainly that led me to where the answers were. And I just remember that moment where everything clicked together and I could really see what it was all about. And that defined everything I've done since then. That was 2010. Oh, wow. Wow. So that's been quite a while. So talk to me a little bit about uh, these mental models, uh, why you think uh, schools aren't teaching students how to learn. A lot of the time you expect kids. To learn, right? <laughs> so, right, well, what, what are some of the things you discovered? Well, we expect them to figure it out on their own, right? We teach yeah, them what to learn yeah. and we send them all home to figure out how to do their homework and study for tests on their own. And we wonder why some kids get D's and some kids get A's. Ah, they work less, they work more, whatever uh, I think the first thing you asked, because there's several questions in there, was about mental models. And that mm -hmm. and that's interesting. The more you know, the more you can know. The more you learn, the more you can learn. The more you know about something, the more easily it is to take fine details out of complex situations. Uh, in, in cognitive science and learning, it's called the, the Matthew effect. The more you have, the more you're given. And the example I use when I give my lectures and things, I say, and this usually works with people, I say, you know, it's like me and my mom watching football. My mom doesn't care about football. It's a bunch of big guys trying to move a ball. That's all she thinks. I happen to love football. So we can be watching the same exact thing. We can watch two teams line up against each other. And where I might say, oh my gosh, they have three, three, uh, three wides and a single high safety. And that's Aaron Rodgers at quarterback. Well, maybe not this year, but anyway, that's Aaron Rodgers at quarterback. Oh my gosh, there's going to be someone open deep down the field. And all she says is, huh, I wonder if they'll move the ball forward. And it's not because my mom's dumb. She's very, very yeah. smart. But it's because she does not have a mental model for football. I built one up just from watching it for years and talking to people about it and things because I'm interested in it. Now, transfer this to the idea of education. You want your kids um, to, in fact, this is, well, let me go back. If you want your kids to really, really be able to participate in class and be able to think critically First, you got to build that model. That model consists of facts. Then it consists of using the facts in the right way, uh, on and on. But it's that mental model. In fact, it's so important. I'm, I think probably most people out there have heard of deliberate practice by now. It's poorly explained, and it's not that complicated, at least at it its very core. But in his book, the guy who came up with the term, if he didn't you know, invent it, it's been around, it's responsible for all accomplishment of humankind ever. Um, except for, you know, winning the lottery, things that happen by chance. And he wrote a book on it. And his whole take is mental representations. Same thing as a mental model. The, the more accurately you can create a mental representation of what you want to do, 
the more accurately you're able to learn to do it. Many people may have heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect. This is where people who are less than skilled at something will do that thing in the learning process and believe they are better than they are. That was fine. I just did a little bit of my homework. That's fine. Go back and check the answers. <laughs> okay. And nine times out of 10, we're not sure because we don't have a good mental model. We're not sure in the beginning. So it's being having less knowledge makes it harder to acquire more knowledge. This is why deliberate practice, the very definition means with a teacher, the same type of practice without a teacher, he calls purposeful practice. And that's what we should be doing when we're on our own teaching ourselves. And so we have this, we're not sure if we have it right. The best way to do it is to build a mental model. That's where a teacher comes in. Uh, and if we can get past that, we can start building those models, which are the foundation of critical thinking. And yeah, think so go ahead. Well, you've talked a lot about kind of these mental models. So how would a um, like a staff member who wants to use this? Um, you said you've given uh, you've spoken a lot. You've given lectures to schools during faculty professional development. So how would a teacher who is just kind of traditionally teaching how would they start using this in their classroom well um you know let me first say that a question you asked previously which feeds right into this is why aren't we taught this in teacher training programs why aren't we taught this anywhere else why aren't we taught this in the arts where in sports where it would really come immediately to bear on everything mm -hmm. we're doing the reason is is because we're not taught that our schools of cognitive science and our schools of education are siloed from each other and they do not really talk there's education studies over here there's a bunch of people who know what's going on over there they don't know how to speak teacher well and teachers have problems digesting the research in the way it's truly meant to be digested you know reading an article about something or other and then try that's not really the way to do it you really have to dig deep in the research to do this right um, and so you asked about how to do this stuff. You know, there's an old saying, pioneers return with arrows in their back. And so there are some things that um, we have to come to realize that maybe aren't exactly what we thought they were. The science is clear on this stuff. And when you use it, as I've used it many, many times, you find that it works. So the very first step um, to building an excellent mental model is getting things into your long-term memory, which our education system is okay at, and then getting things back out of your long-term memory, which our education system is terrible at. It's called retrieval practice. It works amazingly well, but you have to stop and put gaps in between when you retrieve. So how do we get there? Well, the first thing you do is make sure you encode the information that's needed in long-term memory properly. And there's a way to do this quickly. I'll tell you in a moment. This idea that started, I believe, around the 1920s and then really took steam in the 60s and 70s, that memorization isn't learning. And why are we memorizing all these facts and testing on memory? When, well, wheels aren't a car, but without them, I don't care how nice a car you have, you're not going anywhere. And the reason, by the way, we have the testing system that we do isn't because it's great. It's because the whole system itself isn't great. Teaching that many people, you're not going to be able to do individualized education. Who's going to come up with the money to pay enough people to do individualized education? That's not going to happen. So given the environment we have, when we have to educate as many people as possible to be able to speak, read, and do all this other stuff, checking that they have the basic facts through recall on a test is the best system we've got. And considering how poorly how poorly the system is set up only because of the amount of people we have to deal with i don't really think it's anybody's fault um considering that it's a pretty good system so we're always going to need memory no matter what and standard i test standardized tests are always going to need memory need memory but now we're talking about building a mental model what i do when i talk to faculty um large groups of people i go through you maybe 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 many people have heard of this, the palace technique. It's one of many, many ways to get stuff into your memory. You create a visualization, you walk through. And so what I do is I throw like eight random numbers at them, some of them double digits, and I have them build a memory palace. It takes about five minutes in the beginning. And what happens is the first one takes like 90 seconds. The last one takes 20 seconds. You actually get better and better at it over time. And that's just in a few seconds. Then we do retrieval. So I say, I'm going to have a timer go off every five minutes. We're not going to repeat this over and over like we used to do memorization, drill and kill. That, that gets very inefficient very quickly by the second, third, fifth repetition. What you want to do is interrupt the forgetting curve so that you can pull the information out at any time without having just said it a minute ago. This, by the way, is where a lot of testing anxiety comes from. 
And we could take care of a lot of that problem, a lot of it by using appropriate retrieval uh, structures to be able to remember things at test time. So every five minutes we go back and sometimes they get it wrong. They get a few numbers wrong. I said, don't worry about it. Don't review. What you're going to experience is called the testing effect. The testing effect shows that if we try to recall some information that we had previously stored in our long-term memory and we don't get it, that without any further study or work, we are more likely to get it the next time. It becomes stronger even though we didn't know it because the, okay. you work okay. on the act of retrieval. So we sit there, go through. Some people get things wrong. We sit there, go through, and I'm doing my lecture. I'm talking about all the science-y stuff. And then we get to the end um, after about an hour, hour and a half, depends how long I've got. And I say, okay, here's a multiple choice test. And it's all just A through E. It's all just numbers. And A through C is the exact sequence, but it goes off somewhere, two numbers in, three numbers in, whatever it is. So they sit there, and E, D is the answer. And so within a matter of 30 seconds, everyone gets it right, complete confidence in the answer. And I say, did you read all of A or B or C? No. So did you even look at E? No. Why? Because you knew the answer. when the So these strategies we give for like testing anxiety, consider every answer. Come back to the question, all this other stuff. All you're doing is trying to come up with different ways to retrieve. What if you just knew the answer before uh, you had to answer the question? And you can do this by getting basic facts. And so you use things, you know, there's a great little book. It's been around since the 70s. It says like 2 million sold. I don't know why 8 billion haven't been sold of this. It's called The Memory Book by Harry Lorraine and, uh, and Jerry Lucas. Jerry, Harry Lorraine was a musician, a magician rather. And Jerry Lucas was an NBA basketball player. Just try it. It's like seven, eight bucks. You got nothing to lose. And then from there, you can get more complex strategies as to how you do this, excuse me, do this in, cl in class. So you build that model that way. Then you retrieve. So I, I would have what I call a retrieval conveyor belt. Some are on 10 minute retrieval, some are on 20. And, but my class will be so far behind. You bet it will. Two weeks in, you will be behind. Three weeks in, you'll be ahead. Because what, what happens is, is as you start to store dates and facts, and I go through a whole thing how you can learn the Bill of Rights by visualizing, like exactly at any level, you can just know First Amendment, freedom of speech, Second Amendment, right to bear arms, or you can actually get the whole text just by visualizing a story that any kid can do. And so I ask people after we do this, why don't we even know about this to try it when it's out there? It's been out there forever. It's been out there since yeah. the time of the Greeks. Why does no one even? And so what we should be doing is getting stuff into memory. Why do you think so few people want to participate in class participation discussions? Because they don't know what to say. Associative memory works great. If you've got all those facts in there and then you start having conversations as to where those facts fit, people will start jumping in just because they're thinking about things. I mean, we, we've all taught for a long time, right? So who knows the answer to, insert question here. What's that? I'm not sure. I don't want to embarrass myself. Then we can get into a discussion about growth mindset and fixed mindset, how no one should be embarrassed about making a mistake. And if you inculcate that into your teaching, it does become something you can have as a culture in your classroom and in your school. But mindset is generally misrepresented as an oversimplified feel-good trope in the education system nowadays. So if we want to talk about that, we can. But now this kid turns into this because they know. And if they accept that sometimes we make mistakes and retrieval will be better later, then some of them making mistakes doesn't matter. But that's why we're intimidated to participate. We're not sure if we have it right. The stakes shouldn't be so high to get it right anyway, but let's yeah. take that out. We're not sure if we're going to get it right. We want to contribute and not embarrass ourselves. Children are afraid as heck as having their designation of talent or competency jeopardized in front of their peers. Read Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, for ways to deal with that. But when they know, when they know, or when they have something a little wrong. Wait, I thought it was 1775. No, no, no. Don't you remember 1776 Continental Congress? That's exactly how those discussions will start to go because they will have it in their long-term memory. And then you do the retrievals by getting it out through class discussion. And there's all sorts of methods you can use. And that's where critical thinking occurs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. And, you know, thinking about like, yeah, there's a lot of kids that are halfway there. They know the answer, but really having that growth mindset and using these memory techniques that have been around for a long time, like you said, and I will make sure I put the names of those books in the show notes. So uh, as a former music teacher, uh, talk to me a little bit about talent. So why talent is so overrated? Um, and can anyone really uh, be, you know, a, a great musician, for example, if they practice and perform optimally? Well, that's, that's a whole book right there and I'm writing it. <laughs> but, um, but um, 
Uh, yeah, I like the, from the, I call it the great misunderstanding of talent. I can't mm -hmm. prove a negative. Nobody can. I can't prove something doesn't exist. But I can tell you, nobody can prove that it does. And that's when the stories start. But what about the little girl? Okay, what was it? Where in the brain did that occur? What advantage? Well, I mean, uh, but, and there's nothing there. And then the well, what abouts happen? Someone says, well, what about Tiger Woods? And then I explain that. There's a, a total explanation in the books downstairs, a little book on how Earl Woods did it. The amazing training techniques, which all fall into the types of things I'm doing. And when you look at Mozart, that's pretty much a myth too. He was trained from a very young age by a master yeah. teacher who happened to be his father. Um, so... Uh, 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 I'm sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. Uh, we were talking about, um, you were asking music. So what happens is, is because it takes so long and because some of the things we have to do to get there are so inobvious, they're so like building a memory palace. Whoever taught us that? We should learn that in first grade. Whoever taught us that? And it takes so long. We've invented a word, talent, that has no meaning other than magic that's what it means magic how does it work i don't know it's magic how do you identify it well sometimes you can identify it and then sometimes it doesn't pan out and then sometimes someone doesn't have talent and then they're late bloomers in other words when they start to learn well it works when they don't it doesn't but it happens so slowly it's like fingernails growing it happens so slowly you don't notice it or notice the process mm -hmm. so you have to have people who are bought in and trying different things and they start to discover these things on their own and that seems like talent and it took me a long time to figure that out as a music teacher and let me tell you if it's true in music it's got to be true in other places because everyone thinks you need talent to be good at music i can tell you you do not and i want to be really careful because i use tiger woods and use mozart all I'm doing, and because this argument gets convoluted, well, I don't need my kids to be Mozart. That's just cruel. They should just be, okay, fine. The idea of showing that those can be achieved through more than 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, that's a mis total misnomer, more than 10,000 hours to get to that level is supposed to prove that if you do less of it, you can get to lower levels. If you can prove it at the highest, it should be at least enough proof to say, maybe there's something there and I should investigate it as an educator. That's all. There should be enough there just for that. Um, so that's why we use those examples. I'm not saying everyone needs to be Mozart. If it took Mozart 10,000 hours, how long is it going to take you? How long is it going to take you to pass your math test? Four okay, of studying over the course of a couple of weeks. Uh, so when I realized that it was not just the amount of work, but the type of work. That's when you call things in question. I will tell you, the light went on. All of the things I've been seeing when I read Talent is Overrated, it's it's an amazing book. Um, and what I did was, what really got me into the science was I wasn't just going to believe him because he said it. And so I started reading the science, which was a grind. I didn't know how to read it back then. Um, and it is not what we think it is. In fact, here's an exercise for everybody. Whenever you use the word talent or see the word talent, replace it with the word skill and notice that it always works. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I feel like that. I like that. So kind of along those same lines uh, for musicians or people that are in theater, often they get stage fright. Um, so a lot of people seem to get stage fright. So what's the secret to overcoming it? Well, I've actually written a supplement to another small book I wrote for musicians called Stage Fright. Um, so here's the interesting thing. Here's the case that I make uh, when it comes to music and performance. Stay, many times we look towards uh, diagnosable clinical conditions to explain this stuff. Because, right, the science, it's interesting, the science is all about, that I see, mostly about how do you feel when you get on stage, your heart rate goes up, you sweat, yeah. you know, all this stuff. Well, that's great, but maybe the answer is well before then. So, people, uh, so if we look at the amount that social, it's called social anxiety disorder with a performance specifier. And it's interesting that only in the latest edition of the DSM, is that identified? It was never identified before. I guess if enough people say they have it, they'll look into it that way. And so that's supposed to show up. Performance or, or social anxiety disorder in general is supposed to show up in the American population at about 12%. There are different studies, different things you can find. Now, I've been a music teacher long enough to know it affects 99.999% of people. Um, th there are very few that it does not. Huh. And how few seem talented? Hmm. Uh, there are very few that it does not, and it shouldn't be showing at this rate. Something is wrong. Here's what is wrong. Everything that I've spoken about here, you have to have complete recall and mastery of what you're going to get on stage and do in order to feel comfortable. I mean, 
this this interview would be impossible for me if I didn't know my subject. I'd be so nervous. I would be, you know, I do get nervous before I walk on stage in front of a thousand people and talk to them. And I always tell myself, like, you've done this a whole bunch of times. You screw up and you know your stuff well enough that you stop, say, I lost my place and get right back into it. There's two things really contributing. Either lack of preparation, that is, did you get stuff into your long-term memory the right way? Did you get the right stuff in? And hopefully you've got a teacher getting the right stuff in to learn that subject or whatever it is. Then did you do retrieval? That is pulling the stuff out of nowhere because that's what you're going to have to do when you're on stage. Pulling the stuff out of nowhere over and by nowhere, I mean putting a period of time in between when you do it and when you try to remember it. And, and we don't. Those who manage to or who are really enthusiastic about what they're talking about as a little kid seem like they have. Uh, you got you can get me up talking about the Beatles when I was 12 years old. Oh, my gosh, I would look like I had no stage fright at all. Now get me to get up and do my history presentation, which I just did enough studying to get by, hoping I'd be able to pull it off. Um, and then you do more and more and you become more and more used to being in front of people. And that's that's how I developed it. So the idea is the way you retrieve. It's mostly retrieval practice, the way you practice. It's mostly retrieval practice, getting this stuff back out. It has a lot to do with deliberate practice, which I define this way. And technically, this would be purposeful practice if it's without a teacher. Plan, do, reflect. OK, when you do, if you're going to try and get something right and you're trying to learn it, make a plan to learn it, learn it. Then reflect on what you just did to see how well you learned it. This is the piece usually left out. This, in, in music, I call this play and pray in the practice room. You just hope something gets right. This, evaluating what you do all the time to make sure you're doing it right. And if you don't, use that magical, magical education drug called Ask Your Teacher. And that will take care of everything that you need to know and what you're doing. It's harder that way. The brain does not like to do this. It's called orienting selective attention and human beings hate doing it. They'd much rather do things the easier way and tell themselves everything will be okay. Then they freak out in the testing. They have testing anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where the whole stage fright thing comes from. And because we're not taught how to learn, we say, I tried everything. I did all my work and prepared properly. And you're not lying. You're being honest. I, and you know what? I tried it five times. And then I took this course and that. Did you go about it like this to begin with? Did you really reflect on what you're doing? Um, did you do things like record your presentation? In the beginning, you want to do things like that. To see those sorts of things. Well, yes, I did. Did you take? And every time I meet with someone who says these things, I say, okay, then let's take a look. And there's 13 things they're not doing. There's nothing wrong with this. It's not obvious to humans. Thus, we've made the magical word talent, which, which you know, you know there was a time, there was a time when people actually believe life, be life began in the muck underneath the sea that it, it was called spontaneous generation and they because they didn't know how it happened so that's where new creatures come from from you know it's and we obviously figured out differently basically when we can't figure stuff out we make up words that mean magic it's magic it's talent but it's not and once you have that confidence once you really know your stuff inside and out you can uh, get up in front of people and do it and screw up a little bit and it's not that bad and then you do it again. And But yeah, we think we're doing the work and we're not because we've never been shown how. Well, on your website, you have a resource called, uh, your website is called Cracking the Talent Code. You have a free guide on there. So um, what is uh, something people can access on your website that will kind of help them get started with this? Well, um, that actually, that document would be helpful to anyone, but it's geared toward musicians and music learners. And I've okay. got something else for everyone else too. Uh, and, it, and it works great. If you're a music teacher, if you're into me, if you play for a hobby, it doesn't matter if you do Mozart like me, or if you do heavy metal like me, uh, whatever you want to do, you know, rock songs, it works fine. And then there's a lot of stuff in there. And the thing I wrote, which applies to all learning, but is geared towards uh, music is called Cracking the Talent Code. That being said, I've been encouraged a lot and I have started the research and will be writing a book. So what I can do is I can send you a link to that page and I've got a waiting list where I'll send out. I haven't decided what I'm going to do yet, but probably a chapter or two for free uh, as soon as I get them done. Once I get started, okay. it's a quick process. And I, and I will send you that link. So that's for general. It's weird. It's almost been the, um, the bane of me trying to do this. Because I can't, well, what are you going to do? Do you do music? Sure. 
Do you do any music? Sure. Do you do business? Sure. That's what talent is overrated. This is a business book. Can you teach teachers in math? Sure. How about sports? Can you help my wide receivers get better? Yes. Can and it, so it's very weird not being specialized. All the people who I work with in marketing tell me that it's very weird not being specialized, but it's the general overall key to how to get good at anything. So that's the book I'm writing. I'm going to I'll have my music area and I'm there for music. And, and it's not for just serious folks. How many ki- people have kids in music and they're besides themselves with beside themselves with nerves and everyone's in the audience doing this, hoping the kid makes it through? Well, why not just do a little bit of this type of practice and just feel good when you're on stage? The same goes for taking tests and um, uh, testing anxiety and things like that. And I do want to say about testing anxiety, even, and I've spoken to psychologists about this, even those who are diagnosed with social anxiety disorder with a performance specifier can continue doing every therapy they're doing for that and do what I advocate. Because what I advocate is the way you do homework. You're going to have to do your homework anyway. You're going to have to study anyway. So that is more what the general book is going to be about. I still don't know what to call it yet. So, but I'll send you a link for that too. So I'm kind of in several worlds. Yeah, yeah. And there's so, general stuff on my website. And all the okay. stuff I use for music, come 95% of it comes from cognitive science that's about academics, not mm-hmm. about music. The other stuff is about motor learning. Um, okay. So there's a whole bunch of studies and books that I have, a resource that's free, a resource list that's on my website, greggoodhart.com, a resource list that's on my website. Um, There's a whole page that explains my philosophy, not about music. It just explains exactly how the science works and everything. And there's an area on there for teachers and coaches and things like that. So you can learn a lot by going there, no matter what subject you're teaching. But I would recommend getting on my waiting list for the book. Great, great. I'll make sure I include the show notes and in that link in there. Well, we've talked a lot about just uh, cracking the talent code. We've kind of uh, touched the surface on um, kind of other ways of thinking and memory retrieval and how teachers can, um, you know, help their students um, learn those facts and retrieve them. Out of everything we talked about, what's one thing you'd like listeners to remember? How important long-term memory is. I... The, the most elegant definition of learning I've ever heard is from the book, Make It Stick, which is an amazing book on education, but it suffers from the same thing I was talking about before. The people who wrote it think that it's relatively easy for educators to understand. Educators are going to need a little bit more than a little background to really understand. Most people I talk to read it, say it's great, and then they don't do anything that's in the book. I like to use their definition of learning, which is acquiring knowledge and skills and having them readily available from memory so you can make sense of future problems and opportunities. I'd also like to let everyone in on something. I got just a little nervous before I said that. I said, I better get this right. This is the first time I've had to pull it out of nowhere. Um, I I got asked in an interview for a radio station at Arkansas State years ago, and I got it almost right. So what have I been doing? Every day, a reminder pops up that says definition of learning, and I retrieve once. And now I have accurate recall. So getting stuff into memory, not just doing rote rote memory, by the way, you do it with retrieval practice. It's a lot quicker overall. And then all you have to do is work on getting it out. And that's what class discussions are. That's what quizzes are. That's what papers are. That's what projects are. That's the actual act of accessing the proper memories to solve problems, acquiring knowledge and skills, I almost got it wrong. Acquiring knowledge and skills and having them readily available from memory so you can make sense of future problems and opportunities. Yeah. Memory. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a great way of thinking about it and knowing, like, yeah, that's what learning is. We're using the skills we've been, you know, discussing tests, all those types of, types of activities you talked about. So you mentioned um, greatgoodheart.com. Uh, there's a track, tracking the talent code dot us um, for um, other resources. Where can people find you on social media? Uh, I'm not much of a social media person, but you can find me on Facebook. It's called the Learning Coach, Greg Goodhart. Okay. Um, I've also, for anyone who's interested, there's a practicing group called the Art and Science of Practicing Finding Real Solutions. 
um, that uh, that's if you're into music or if you want to see some of the solutions people in there come up with and try to use them because all the solutions are the same. All we're doing is taking okay. time and stuff and applying it. Um, so, but that, you know, I have an Instagram thing and yeah, I'm probably going to have to start doing more of that stuff. All teachers, do you remember when the internet started and you were forced to write a bio? Remember that? Or people mm -hmm. wanted you to post on Twitter. That's kind of where I'm at right now. <laughs> I'll do what I can, but yes, you can find me there and you can find me at my website and, and I do post things actually pretty interesting things, I think. And, uh, it looks like my next thing is to just put my dumb thoughts that I have on a daily basis into little videos and put those up too. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great, great. Well, I'll make sure to send people that in that direction. Well, thank you so much for being my guest on the Out of the Trenches podcast today. I learned a lot and I hope this will give teachers resources to think about other ways of teaching and helping their students retrieve information. Thank you. I love this. You are so much fun to talk to. I People who know education and are curious are just so much fun to talk to. Thank you.